This is the 20th anniversary of the Wondering.net, and we pulled out a few of the stops and we brought back one of the original first panelists, John Tookish, Ben Asher over there. He was on our very first panel in uh, 2001, joining... Um, um, back in the day. Yeah, so um, what do you remember about coming out for that? So we, we, there were just a few of us. You all know Cliff Broadway, could be, right? Yay. And uh, Chris Brown and Cal Surrey, one of the founders of the website. Um, and it was, uh, it was amazing. Do you want me to continue on for a moment, or? Um, you know what? No, because we're gonna get to a picture that we can go on to. Um, <laughs> but I'm, <laughs> That's why? What I'm gonna have, um, Kelly talk about for just a second is just what are we looking at on the screen? Can you see the screen? Happy 20th anniversary to the OneRing.net. Best wishes from none other than Daniel Reeve. 1998, 1999, and um, found a community there. Uh, I, they had a chat room, lo and behold, I went to the chat room, my first chat experience, and there was a guy named Alan who bowed, and I was like, oh my god, Alan the Dwarf has greeted me. So, you know, it's really welcomed in, and, and I think community is one of the enduring themes that um, Torn represents. How many of you have been around for a while with us, with The One Ring? I mean, look at that, and um, found a community there. Uh, I, they had a chat room, lo and behold, I went to the chat room, my first chat experience, and there was a guy named Alan who bowed, and I was like, oh my god, Alan the Dwarf has greeted me. So, you know, it's really welcomed in, and, and I think community is one of the enduring themes that um, Torn represents. How many of you have been around for a while with us, with The One Ring? I mean, look at that. I, um, so very organically, you know, from one of the rooms in my house, getting involved and, and rising up the ranks, and uh, coming, you know, to Comic-Con for the first time. I looked at the map of Comic-Con the other day, and <laughs> it, you could fit five of them into today's Comic-Con, it was just insane. There were like f less than 45,000 participants back then. Um, so, the old guy here on the ship. Um, and uh, the partnership, the community that, that happened in, in getting to know the amazing folks at, at, at Weta, Richard and his team, Daniel and, and David, um, and there were cast and crew running around, and it was kind of low-key and intimate. Um, and I think that everybody who raised their hand has sort of had that connection. Okay, so you'll notice the uh, fifth item down. It says the Facebook group, The Worlds and Words of Tolkien. We started this Facebook group just about two months ago, maybe less, and there's already 6,000 plus people in it. Um, and there's such energy, and they're from all over the world. I get alerts to approve people to join from Turkey and Slovakia and Poland and India, and I get, I get you know, things that are, where it's not even in English, but then I look and they said, oh, I first read The Hobbit in 1975. And I'm like, oh, okay, this guy's in. <laughs> um, and the, um, the discussion has been so awesome. Talking about the movies, talking about the books, talking about Tolkien's other work, like Roverandum. We're gonna get to the books, some of his peripheral books in, in a few minutes. Um, but right after, I mean, actually just before Comic-Con in 2001, um, our staff was actually um, invited to Pan when um, the New Line presented the 10 minute, the um, cave troll and the, um, the Moria, the Battle of Moria with the cave troll and all that. They, they premiered 10 minutes of that, which they then released later on for people to watch um, through the press and everything, but they released this in Cannes um, and the Wondering.net was invited. Josh Long. Yes, this one oh, you cipher the card game. <laughs> yeah, I have a whole bunch of those at home. Um, you know, you had, it was, it's basically Magic the Gathering type for fans of Lord of the Rings. And uh, they had different cards, you know, some of them were foils, some of them weren't. Um, and I think it covered all the movies, and I think there were some sets that were set after the movies. I think uh, they had some cards that, like, had, like, Tom Bombadil and, and stuff, but uh, I don't know how widely uh, they were dispersed those were. And meeting with Weta and the guys with the cipher all at this this big sort of series of tables. I think it might have been right here in the Marriott. Maybe someone in the room can clarify that. But um, 
part of that part of that connection. And part of the um, the reason why Decipher Up, I put them in here, they, not just that they had one of the first games that was involved with the, the tie-in with the movie, but they also were the official fan club. Is there anyone in this room who joined the fan club? That means you're on the DVD, the uh, extended editions for Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. How many people are for Fellowship of the Ring? There's only a few of you that had hands up. How many people were actually fan clubs for all three years? Yeah. It was only 100 bucks, are you kidding? Yeah, best 100 bucks ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you get one amount for one year, a, a higher amount for two years, and it was, yeah, you're right, it was $100, I think, for all three years, and I'm like, I'm going to be in the credits for three movies. Yeah, you know, I yeah. put my actual name on it because I'm like, if my name is going to be on the Lord of the Rings movies, I want it to be my name. <laughs> <laughs> of course, my name um, ends with a U, the last name. So I have to wait an additional 10 minutes in that first movie just to see my name. Um, and Howard Shore actually wrote more music to, for that extended um, um, credit sequence because it's only in the extended edition. So, uh, so aside from writing more music for the extended scenes, he wrote more music just for, that, um, for those, those credits, which was really kind of cool. So we get that awesome music and our names scrolling up the screen. All right, this is more for you, Josh. Just tell me if you can recognize any of the other people in that movie, that picture. Um, well, I know obviously back in the you know you got the sideshow and what of folks together. You, you know, there's uh, Richard Taylor and his family in the one in the lower portion. Uh, there's Tom Gilliland, Jared Chapman, who Jared doesn't work at sideshow anymore, but he used to. Uh, Tom Gilliland still at sideshow. Uh, I think Daniel Sexy Diamond Diamond Is Heath in there from sideshow? Who is? I think yeah, he's down this in the back with the right behind there. Tanya. Yeah, he's in the back. Um, yeah, there's a lot of yeah. There's, I mean, I can uh, um, Dave Tremont's in that picture. Um, man, the, I really wish the big thing right. about that picture is that was the booth for Sideshow in 2001. <laughs> Have you been on the floor lately? Have you seen how big their booth is? And then Weta, Weta and Sideshow, they were you know together in this booth. And now they've got their space as well that they do these amazing things at with these shows. So now you can see the difference between 2001 and 2019. And on this point, before we go any further, we actually have a special guest for you. Richard? I'm going to ask you a question. Um, I didn't have hearing aids in 2001. I do now. So. <laughs> and in fact, I didn't have a daughter, and now I do. There she is. <laughs> so I was just going to ask you, um, uh, at whether you guys work on, I mean, obviously Lord of the Rings is one of the first really big productions you did, but you work now on, because you guys are now a powerhouse in, in effects, um, in the industry, and you work on a lot of different products. How many do you actually have a relatively close tie with a fan community that sort of lets you know what they like and what they don't like? And, and how is that different than some of the other properties you work with? Um, well, we, we obviously have, we, we, we were working for 10 years before we started on Lord of the Rings. We spent seven years in Middle Earth and understandably, as much as we'd love to have remained in Middle Earth, uh, we wanted to keep our team together, and we wanted to, uh, we, we weren't particularly focused on growing our team necessarily, because I like to think we're opportunity builders, not empire builders, and, uh, but projects come along that demand more uh, endeavor and more talent and more people, so you grow, and, uh, and the team, that was with us on Lord of the Rings have stayed pretty consistent. Some of the junior people that were on set technicians are now some of our most senior staff. A young guy that joined me in his late teens as a elf dresser is now the head of our manufacturing studio, uh, Rob Gillies, and uh, there's many, many stories like that. Of course, the most uh, well-known is Daniel Falconer. 
that was uh, working with us uh, on a variety of projects when uh, the famous phone call uh, came through from Peter that said, uh, grab the guys, the guys being Tanya, um, Jamie Bess Warwick, Ben Wotton, Warren Mahi, um, Christian Rivers, uh, and uh, Daniel Falconer, and myself. Grab some fish and chips, and while you're at it, grab some fish and chips, and while you're at it, grab some coke, and you better get around here, I've got something to tell you. And uh, what we, we went around and we sat on the floor of his writing room, and what he told us was that um, he was about to start on Lord of the Rings. And, uh, and Daniel has, uh, Daniel at that point, although we have got some inkling of his passion for Middle Earth, got a chance to really bring to the fore how significant his knowledge was. This was a very, very young person from, from New Zealand who happened to be uh, one of the world, world's most knowledgeable people on the mythology of Middle Earth and the writings of Tolkien. And he became one of the cornerstones of knowledge through the next seven years, writing much of the bios for the actors, helping the actors understand their history uh, and so on. And, and Daniel, of course, has gone on to um, retain that position in our workshop and has been the burning torch for us, stay connected to the fan group and kept us connected to the fan group. Uh, it's worth mentioning, you know, that creating the collectibles originally as a partnership with Sideshow and then going out alone has obviously uh, been a delightful thing, but the greatest thing about it is it's kept us connected to you as a group of people, to the, to the fans of Middle Earth in a way that we could never have hoped to had we just finished the film and moved on. And uh, the pleasure and enjoyment that that has specifically given me, but our greater group, has been immeasurable. I, I often get people, someone just said it to me only a few hours ago on the floor, um, oh, you're so humble and it's so good that you come to every, uh, every one of these cons and, you know, you're so nice to come and talk to us. That's lovely, and it was a lovely compliment, but of course I'm getting an equal if not greater amount out of the experience than that person. Because, you know, I, I don't think of the people that are fans as some distant group that are disconnected from us. I think of those people as us, as the same people as us. We all love the literature, we all love the films, we all love what Peter created. And associating with people on the floor, getting to talk with them about that love is an immensely rewarding thing. And 20 years later, I'm now 54, I'm an older man, and still having people come up wanting to talk about what we did 20 years ago is immensely fulfilling. And uh, as many of you can contest to, you've come down and stayed with us, you've hung out with us in New Zealand. Some of you have even, Hannah here came and worked with us just a few months ago <laughs> as a person that came up and talked to us on the floor here at Comic-Con. So uh, it's definitely been, you talk to community, it has definitely been the most extraordinary community that has existed in our lives. There will never be another one like it, I have no doubt. I say to our team, never before and never again. Yeah. But that ecosystem, that ecology of friendship and community and love and respect and dynamic have existed as it did in that moment. And the people here today are testament to that. And, and these groups are all over the world. I've just been sent some photographs from a German friend of mine that has just been to a, a Lord of the Rings convention in Germany. And it's insane the number of cosplayers and the fanaticism and the, the joy of celebrating the films and the literature. And uh, long may it last. Roll long for you. Back at you know what is here, so I we knew that we could get Richard. He actually showed up just like this on the very first panel we did in 2001. And at the time, 
no one knew what to expect of the Lord of the Rings film. They didn't know what Peter would make because his backlog was mostly horror. I mean, he had heavenly creatures and frighteners, so some of them, you know, there was some nice artistry there. But he was an outsider of Hollywood, and no one knew what to expect. We were all kind of cautiously optimistic. And then Richard joined us, and as you can tell, he's very good at speaking. And I remember I went, that very day, I went from being cautiously optimistic cautiously optimistic to want to be a cheerleader for the film because I knew how much passion he and everyone on his team was putting into those films. Um, which is really nice to get is, is that, that, um, that the filmmakers really are really behind it so that you know that, that, that Tolkien's work that you treasure so much is in good hands. And um, which is becoming important now because there's new hands taking over. But before we get there, mm -hmm. um, Kelly, did you want to jump in real quick on your stint down in New Zealand? Well, that was, um, I, I, I helped Daniel Falconer write uh, Middle Earth from script to screen, building the world of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. And, um, what a smashing job you did. I'd say that, that um, I also met Richard as a fan of Lord of the Rings. It was at my very first Comic Con, but but through being a fan and from pursuing my um, my career as a writer, it led to this amazing opportunity. And I don't know if I would have been considered for the for the project if I wasn't a fan. And if you know if it just it just didn't make sense otherwise. So you just it goes to show that you never know what will happen when you follow your passion and you and you follow your heart. And I'm very, very thankful for that opportunity. And it was an absolute joy to work with Daniel. Um, I, I just had a blast. And I couldn't believe that I was getting paid to do it. Like, I would sit there every day writing about Lord of the Rings and Middle Earth. And I'm like, and this is a job? <laughs> so. That's cool. Go ahead. You know, Kelly, Kelly, you hit that word, passion. Um, and it, yeah, I think that's what we're all about, and the sense of authenticity, which just just sort of sprung from that passion, and, and Richard sharing how Daniel's passion for the literature um, was such a key motivator, and that's what we all connected. And honestly, we're all sitting here hoping that that authenticity, that that community, um, and that trueness to Tolkien's work and what he actually wrote on paper is going to continue to carry forward. All right, moving on. Um, some more things from the history of the Wondering.net, which gets a little weird. We hosted an Oscar party. We actually hosted six Oscar parties. Um, anybody here go to any of the Oscar parties? I know a few of you did. In fact, I knew she did the lighting for the last one. <laughs> Um, uh, Richard, I know he went. <laughs> a couple of them. Oh, and that, there he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There he is at the first Oscar oh, party. Oh, with yeah. Who's that guy all the way on the left there? I don't know, some dude. <laughs> so, so back then, we hosted these parties. It was more a fundraiser for the website so we could um, buy a new server because all of the fans who saw the movie came to our site to chat about it, to post on the message boards, to submit um, reviews, and you guys broke it. Our, the, our little hamster wheel broke. Um, so we hosted these parties so we could do some raffles and some auctions and make some money and buy a new server. So thank you to those of you who came um, because we were able to get a new server. Yay! Um, but out of politeness, we invited the cast and crew. I don't think any of us thought any of them would show up. <laughs> but you can see otherwise. So how many people up here on stage was up? I, mean, I know you were at the first Oscar party. And we were, at the we first were like so ready. We wanted John, to be like John's the, in that picture. We wanted to be like the, the secret service protecting these guys as they came in. And, yeah. You know, like, okay. Big operation. They're showing up. They're going to even have the Oscars with them. And oh my gosh. Right. Oh, well, I, I was just an attendee at the first one, nice. and, and it was like just a mind-blowing experience because you go there and you're like, 
oh, we're going to hang out with fans, we're going to watch the Oscars, and we're going to celebrate the movies, that's cool, and then everybody from the movie shows up carrying their Oscars, and I'm like, what is life? <laughs> And, well, and that there's, connection again. And there's two it. things I remember from that party. One was Sir Ian McKellen walking in going, Thou shall not win. Because yeah. <laughs> remember, he was nominated. Yeah. The second thing I remember from that after we ushered Richard and Peter Jackson and everybody out was, they're going to expect more at the next party. I mean, the fans, we knew the fans would expect We were like, how do we top that? <laughs> Also, there was, a, there was a sense of reconnecting, because seeing Richard again, it's like, oh yeah, we remember each other, there's a, there's a familiarity there. And then they were so relaxed, you know, and, and I think what we heard later was our party was sort of like the breather. It's like, ah, they came off of the big Academy Awards, they came and they chilled out, they put their Oscars on the pool table in the VIP room, which was an amazing sight, and they just kind of relaxed. And, you know, people being amazing that you are. Because we're family. They're right. family, right? Yeah, we, we, um, we obviously had options. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a lot of potential parties to go to, and uh, there was no question where we were going. And I think a lot of the decision was influenced by the, uh, ex that the experience of going into the Oscars. You know, the Oscars are very odd uh, for us because uh, you watch them your whole childhood and growing up. And when I was nominated uh, to go and um, represent our company, a large number of our staff were awkwardly embarrassed for me that I should be going to America and be seen to lose live on television. <laughs> being being self-effacing Kiwis because the concept of possibly winning was beyond their wildest imagination. And I used to say, why shouldn't it be us? You know, yeah. why, why should, and I, at some level, sharing the same um, Kiwi sensibility, maybe I was just propping myself up a little bit. Uh, my, my wife was uh, pregnant with our first child, Sam. Uh, obviously a good choice of name, uh, <laughs> of our very dear friend uh, Sam Weiss. Uh, but um, we, uh, so I took my mum, and my mum was straight off the farm, and uh, she had never been to anything like this, neither had I. And, uh, and uh, when Robert Redford came up and uh, congratulated me as I was holding these two Oscars, before he was out of uh, earshot, my mum went, Oh, he looks a lot larger on the telly. <laughs> At which point I saw him physically drop. <laughs> But, um, but it was a joy for her, and sadly my mum passed away 10 years ago, and I would fly up to Auckland every weekend, as my wife and children did for nearly a year, um, to go and sit with her on her bedside. And it was her desire to talk about that night, which was the primary thing we used to talk about, and the party. Uh, but it was the warmth that some of you that were on the red carpet that welcomed us, that caused us to want to continue the same emotion when we left uh, the Oscars. And we had these awards and we were all together. Um, uh, Orlando came to our party last night and um, he spent the whole time he was there uh, talking with Tanya and I and reminiscing and saying how much he missed that community and and although he had gone on to do extraordinary things, it was never the same again. And and he and he um, and he so longed for that. And as he was leaving, he gave me a big hug and you know said that he loved us all and um, what happened to him through those years was transformational because of the community of what was created around those films. And it's so funny that less than 24 hours later I'd be sitting here uh, having that memory in my mind of the impact it had on that young 17 year old that turned up in New Zealand. But that night and what you all did for us 
Uh, and we, of course, did for you in the way that we connected on that evening, I think, really uh, set the foundation for what would become uh, this 20-year odyssey of friendship and, um, and, and collaboration and uh, desire to keep this alive. So uh, it, was, it was a very lovely moment. Yeah, it's really great to be uh, Aside from Oscar parties, we also do little things. So for those of you who are local, every year we host a Baggins birthday bash. Um, and we started that in 2002, so just a few months after the Oscars, we were celebrating the birth of fictional characters. <laughs> we do it every year at Griffith Park. So should any of you be around LA on September 22nd, which this year is on a Sunday, um, when the 22nd falls in the middle of the week, we still do it on a weekend because who can go out and picnic all day long and eat like a hobbit during a work week or a school week? Um, the one thing that's really cool about this picture is you'll notice that there's at least three or four generations in this picture. Um, and that is another thing that is a hallmark of the OneRing.net and, and of Tolkien fandom is that it pretty much is for everybody of all ages. Right? Right? Yeah. Everybody here reading it to their kids? Got it. Um, you mean it's like a family show? It what? is like a family show, yes. Or a family movie, or a family book, or a family party. I mean, the Oscar parties were obviously not all ages, but the Baggins birthday bash, which we've been doing now for 17 years, is. So, yay. It's so much fun. I love going every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does our um, I, uh, Bilbo's speech. I, I recite Bilbo's speech oh, cool. at every one. Wow. And I, I, don't, I don't know, it's like I've been doing it for about five, six years now, doing the speech. I almost haven't memorized it. <laughs> <laughs> what happens at the end? John, talk about the Green Book oh, sure. and, and um, go ahead. So um, one of the areas of the website, and we were always kind of amazed at how big this thing got. It just grew and grew because you guys kept giving us stuff, art, news, stories. So someone had the idea of um, gathering things on a little bit of a more organized and certainly a bit of a different level and creating a, a scholarly section called Green Books. Green as in raw and, and kind of unrefined, um, as in uh, contrast with the red book, which of course is a great word for it. Um, and so uh, there are some phenomenal contributors, including um, a, to this day, um, anonymous published Tolkien scholar, um, in addition to Quick Beam, our own Clifford Broadway, and uh, some other folks. I had the crude humor section, that was how I got roped in with green books, but Eventually, um, two actual novels were, were published. Novels, sorry. Two texts were published. And they are collections of essays, um, early film reviews, and so forth uh, that we produced from the website. So it's just another iteration of that passion and what happens when you bring the community together for the right reasons, for that kind of pure love of the work. Yeah. Um, all right, so yes, we did host another party, Two Towers. We went from 400 people to 800 people. And that banner is, I think, 60 by 80 feet. Um, a theater donated it to me, and once it came down off the theater, they stored it in my garage, and it was folded up, and it was like this big. Um, and really heavy, and I think it took about 10 of us to hang it. <laughs> and then, of course, it was a solid banner, and now we put it behind the stage, and people had to get on stage. So we actually had to slice little holes in it, to, or, or just a straight slice so people could slide through to get on and off the stage. Um, but it really made a great backdrop for the band, don't you think? <laughs> and then we, we kind of took over the rest of the building. We weren't in this big theater space, right? In the first... The yeah, first the first year. one we weren't this big, we were upstairs. So this is a big room that sat 500? Yep, yep. Yeah. And then we used the pool and we had... Yep. Yeah, we had this, this, is the, yeah. <laughs> this is the Hollywood Athletic Club. Yeah, Absolutely. this is the historic Hollywood Athletic Club, which you can't tell because it's just a matter of two towers. <laughs> but um, it is like a historic Hollywood Athletic Club. Look, oh, Richard came back and so did everybody else with all their Oscars. This was the third Oscar party. So that's them backstage getting ready to come meet. For those of you who were here that were there. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that was a big toast. 
and that was everybody on stage. And if I remember correctly, because I was sick and I was in the other room grading, um, um, you know the trivia thing you do where people guess who's going to win all the Oscars? Mm -hmm. I was grading all those papers. I don't think anyone realized that Lord of the Rings, or that the, the Return of the King was going to do what it did that night. Um, not only did it get 11 nominations, it got 11 wins. And it's the most awarded uh, uh, clean sweep. Because there have been other movies that have won more than 11, but this one was a clean sweep, and it was the most Oscars for a clean sweep. So, um, I just remember it felt like the, the, we were in the American Legion Hall, and we almost blew the roof off. And the only reason why we didn't is because we had a beacon fire on top of it. <laughs> Literally, we had a beacon fire on top of the roof, and the fire marshal was like, you can't was have a, a fire on your roof. <laughs> like, you do realize you're in Hollywood, right? It, it, was, it was strips of cellophane and a big fan, but from the street level, the way it was lit, it looked like a real fire, and the fire marshal actually almost came and shut us down because of it. <laughs> Richard, how many uh, total Oscars did you all bring in at that point? Uh, well, the whole lot came along. Um, I, I have been fortunate to collect, we've been nominated five times at the workshop and collected four over the three years, uh, two on the first year and two on the third year. Um, What's unusual about our Oscar win is the fact that we won in the first place, of course, which was truly mind-boggling, but we won across three different disciplines. We've actually got a Guinness Book of Records, which I found totally bizarre. This bloke turned up at Comic-Con one year, tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, um, if you're willing to accept it, I'd like to uh, give you this Guinness Book of Records, because you're the first company ever to win outside of one discipline. You've won across three, because we, we have wonderful visual effects, makeup, and costume. And, um, you know, that I, I, I'm very much of the view that you collect an Oscar for your, for your, or any award, you collect an award for your family and friends back home. Uh, you know, an actor could arguably be uh, there to collect an Oscar for the people that help them to get there. And uh, so, I returned with the Oscars back home, and, um, we bought uh, 250 plastic Oscars from some very lucky tourist shop <laughs> <laughs> and put them in uh, black rubbish sacks and my wife and Tanya and I delivered them into the Wellington airport and all of our team were there and we distributed these, uh, these plastic Oscars and it was, that was the most euphoric moment of my life on that stage that night, but coming home to the airport and all the other poor passengers had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a particularly excitable um, crew, as those of you that know them and have ever been to one of our fancy dress parties can contest to. Um, I never put the labels on the Oscars. Uh, I uh, ultimately uh, left the labels off because I, I love the fact that people have felt that they're theirs as much as they're mine. The Shuan earthquake, which was a horrific earthquake that killed a huge tens of thousands of people, mainly school children and collapsed school buildings. And uh, myself and my colleague Bree and Greg Broadmoor, who you've met uh, potentially with the Got Dr. Broadmoor stuff, we went to China and we put on a massive art exhibition with some wonderful friends up in China. And I took the Oscars to try and uh, raise money and uh, I go and lecture at schools and just hand the, in rooms bigger than this, filled with school kids. And I would hand these Oscars out into the crowd and they would just, they'd disappear for half an hour as the kids, because all, all Chinese kids I think must know the Oscars and they'd all come back back to the stage. And, and at the end, I figured, what a shame to take them home with me. So we left them there for five months. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, they, they eventually turned up one day back in New Zealand. 